Woo-hoo. Welcome back, everybody, to Inebriation Nation. This is Teach here with you as always. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Today we're going to be playing uh, the Stanley Parable. Um, and thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, we're not going to do any live commentary on this. I'm just going to welcome you guys to the to the show, and uh, we're going to make it happen. Um, I am super excited about playing this game for you guys, and I hope you guys enjoy it. If you do like it, please uh, subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. Uh, leave me a comment in the uh, section below. And let me know how you like what's going on. All right, guys, we'll be back with you shortly. Enjoy the Stanley Parable. This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on a keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened, something that would forever change Stanley something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened, this complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and stepped out of his office. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. No matter how hard Stanley looked, he couldn't find a trace of his co-workers. Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. a room worth admiring. It had really been worth the detour after all, just to spend a few moments here in this immaculate, beautifully constructed room. Stanley simply stood here, drinking it all in. Yes, really, really worth it being here in the room. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left.
Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago. Look, Stanley, I think perhaps we've gotten off on the wrong foot here. I'm not your enemy, really, I'm not. I realize that investing your trust in someone else can be difficult, but the fact is that the story has been about nothing but you all this time. There's someone you've been neglecting, Stanley. Someone you've forgotten about. Please, stop trying to make every decision by yourself. Now, I'm not asking for me, I'm asking for her. This is it, Stanley. Your chance to redeem yourself, to put your work aside, to let her back into your life. She's been waiting. But in his eagerness to prove that he is in control of the story and no one gets to tell him what to do, Stanley leapt from the platform and plunged to his death. Good job, Stanley. Everyone thinks you are very powerful. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Stanley stepped into the broom closet, but there was nothing here, so he turned around and got back on track. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. But Stanley just couldn't do it. He considered the possibility of facing his boss, admitting he had left his post during work hours. He might be fired for that. And in such a competitive economy, why had he taken that risk? All because he believed everyone had vanished. His boss would think he was crazy. And then something occurred to Stanley. Maybe, he thought to himself, maybe I am crazy. All of my co-workers blinking mysteriously out of existence in a single moment for no reason at all? None of it made any logical sense. And as Stanley pondered this, he began to make other strange observations. For example, why couldn't he see his feet when he looked down? Why did doors close automatically behind him wherever he went? And for that matter, these rooms were starting to look pretty familiar. Were they simply repeating? No, Stanley said to himself, this is all too strange, this can't be real. And at last, he came to the conclusion that had been on the tip of his tongue. He just hadn't found the words for it. I'm dreaming, he yelled. This is all a dream. Oh, what a relief, Stanley felt, to have finally found an answer, an explanation. His co-workers weren't actually gone. He wasn't going to lose his job. He wasn't crazy after all. And he thought to himself, I suppose I'll wake up soon. I'll have to go back to my boring real-life job pushing buttons. I may as well enjoy this while I'm still lucid. So, he imagined himself flying, 
and began to gently float above the ground. Then he imagined himself soaring through space on a magical star field, and it too appeared. It was so much fun, and Stanley marveled that he had still not woken up. How was he remaining so lucid? And then perhaps the strangest question of them all entered Stanley's head. One he was amazed he hadn't asked himself sooner. Why is there a voice in my head dictating everything that I'm doing and thinking? Now the voice was describing itself being considered by Stanley, who found it particularly strange. I'm dreaming about a voice describing me, thinking about how it's describing my thoughts, he thought. And while he thought it all very odd, and wondered if this voice spoke to all people in their dreams, the truth was that, of course, this was not a dream. How could it be? Was Stanley simply deceiving himself, believing that if he's asleep, he doesn't have to take responsibility for himself? Stanley is as awake right now as he's ever been in his life. Now, hearing the voice speak these words was quite a shock to Stanley. After all, he knew for certain, beyond a doubt, that this was in fact a dream. Did the voice not see him float and make the magical stars just a moment ago? How else would the voice explain all that? This voice was a part of himself too, surely, surely, if he could just... He would prove it. He would prove that he was in control, that this was a dream. So he closed his eyes gently, and he invited himself to wake up. He felt the cool weight of the blanket on his skin, the press of the mattress on his back, the fresh air of a world outside this one. Let me wake up, he thought to himself. I'm through with this dream. I wish it to be over. Let me go back to my job. Let me continue pushing the buttons. Please, it's all I want. I want my apartment and my wife and my job. All I want is my life exactly the way it's always been. My life is normal. I am normal. Everything will be fine. I am okay. Stanley began screaming. Please, someone, wake me up. My name is Stanley. I have a boss. I have an office. I am real. Please, just someone tell me I am real. I must be real. I must be. Can anyone hear my voice? Who am I? Who am I? And everything went black. This is the story of a woman named Mariella. Mariella woke up on a day like any other. She arose, got dressed, gathered her belongings, and walked to her place of work. But on this particular day, her walk was interrupted by the body of a man who had stumbled through town talking and screaming to himself, and then collapsed dead on the sidewalk. And although she would soon turn to go call for an ambulance, for just a few brief moments, she considered the strange man. He was obviously crazy, this much she knew. Everyone knows what crazy people look like. And in that moment, she thought to herself how lucky she was to be normal. I am sane. I am in control of my mind. I know what is real and what isn't. It was comforting to think this, and in a certain way, seeing this man made her feel better. But then she remembered the meeting she had scheduled for that day the very important people whose impressions of her would affect her career, and by extension, the rest of her life. She had no time for this, so it was only a moment that she stood there, staring down at the body. And then she turned and ran. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo.
When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office. Oh no, oh no, 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 not again. I won't be part of this. I'm not going to encourage you. I'm not going to say anything. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, unraveled, Stanley wondered in disbelief who orchestrated this, what dark secret was being held from him. What he could not have known was that the keypad behind the boss's desk guarded the terrible truth that his boss had been keeping from him. And so the boss had assigned it an extra secret pin number, 28 Four, five. But of course, Stanley couldn't possibly have known this. Yet incredibly, by simply pushing random buttons on the keypad, Stanley happened to input the correct code by sheer luck. Amazing. He stepped into the newly opened passageway. Descending deeper into the building, Stanley realized he felt a bit peculiar. It was a stirring of emotion in his chest, as though he felt more free to think for himself, to question the nature of his job. Why did he feel this now, when for years it had never occurred to him? This question would not go unanswered for long. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. The lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold, Stanley thought to himself. Did he have the strength to find out? jumped to life, their true nature revealed. Each bore the number of an employee in the building, Stanley's co-workers. The lives of so many individuals reduced to images on a screen, and Stanley, one of them, eternally monitored in this place where freedom meant nothing. This mind control facility, it was too horrible to believe. It couldn't be true. Had Stanley really been under someone's control all this time? Was this the only reason he was happy with his boring job? That his emotions had been manipulated to accept it blindly? No, he refused to believe it. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never! It was unthinkable. 
wasn't it? Was it even possible? Had he truly spent his entire life utterly blind to the world? But here was the proof, the heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions, happy or sad or content, walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he would dismantle the controls once and for all. Oh, Stanley, you didn't just activate the controls, did you? After they kept you enslaved all these years, you go and you try to take control of the machine for yourself. Is that what you wanted? Control? Oh, Stanley, I applaud your effort, I really do. But you need to understand, there's only so much that machine can do. You were supposed to let it go, turn the controls off, and leave. If you want to throw my story off track, you're going to have to do much better than that. I'm afraid you don't have nearly the power you think you do. For example, and I believe you'll find this pertinent, Stanley suddenly realized he had just initiated the network's emergency detonation system. In the event that this machine is activated without proper DNA identification, nuclear detonators are set to explode, eliminating the entire complex. How long until detonation then? Hmm, let's say, um, two minutes. Ah, now this is making things a little more fun, isn't it, Stanley? It's your time to shine. You are the star. It's your story now. Shape it to your heart's desires. Oh, this is much better than what I had in mind. What a shame we have so little time left to enjoy it. Mere moments until the bomb goes off. But what precious moments each one of them is. More time to talk about you about me, where we're going, what all this means. I barely know where to start. What's that? You'd like to know where your co-workers are? A moment of solace before you're obliterated? All right, I'm in a good mood. You're gonna die anyway. I'll tell you exactly what happened to them. I erased them. I turned off the machine. I set you free. Of course, that was merely in this instance of the story. Sometimes when I tell it, I simply let you sit there in your office forever, pushing buttons endlessly and then dying alone. Other times, I let the office sink into the ground, swallowing everyone inside, or I let it burn to a crisp. I have to say this, though. This version of events has been rather amusing. Watching you try to make sense of everything and take back the control wrested away from you, it's quite rich. I almost hate to see it go. But I'm sure whatever I come up with on the next go around will be even better. My goodness, only 34 seconds left. But I'm enjoying this so much. You know what? To hell with it. I'm going to put some extra time on the clock. Why not? These are precious additional seconds, Stanley. Time doesn't grow on trees. Oh dear me, what's the matter, Stanley? Is it that you have no idea where you're going or what you're supposed to be doing right now? Or did you just assume when you saw that timer that something in this room was capable of turning it off? I mean, look at you. Running from button to button, screen to screen, clicking on every little thing in this room. These numbered buttons, no, these colored ones, or maybe this big red button, or this door. Everything, anything, something here will save me. Why would you think that, Stanley? That this video game can be beaten? One solved? Do you have any idea what your purpose in this place is? <laughs> Stanley, you're in for quite a disappointment. But here's a spoiler for you. That timer isn't a catalyst to keep the action moving along. It's just seconds ticking away to your death. You're only still playing instead of watching a cutscene because I want to watch you for every moment that you're powerless to see you made humble. This is not a challenge, it's a tragedy. You wanted to control this world, that's fine. But I'm going to destroy it first, so you can't. 
Take a look at the clock, Stanley. That's 30 seconds you have left to struggle. 30 seconds until a big boom and then nothing. No ending here, just you being blown to pieces. Will you cling desperately to your frail life, or will you let it go peacefully? Another choice? Make it count. Or don't. It's all the same to me, all a part of the joke. And believe me, I will be laughing at every second of your inevitable life from the moment we fade in until the moment I say, happily ever up. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. What could it mean? Stanley wondered aloud to nobody. He began wildly tearing through papers on the boss's desk, pulling books off the shelf, looking behind paintings, desperate for clues to his situation. But his attention was caught by a keypad behind the boss's desk. What could its purpose be? In fact, this keypad guarded the terrible secret that lay buried below his feet. And so the boss had assigned it an extra secret pin number, 2845. But of course, Stanley couldn't possibly have known this. Yet incredibly, by simply pushing random buttons on the keypad, Stanley happened to input the correct code by sheer luck. Amazing. He stepped into the newly opened passageway. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. Although this passageway had the word escape written on it, the truth was that at the end of this hall, Stanley would meet his violent death. The door behind him was not shut. Stanley still had every opportunity to turn around and get back on track. At this point, Stanley was making a conscious, concerted effort to walk forward and willingly confront his death. Stanley was inched closer and closer to his demise. He reflected that his life had been of no consequence whatsoever. Stanley can't see the bigger picture. He doesn't know the real story, trapped forever in his narrow vision of what this world is. Perhaps his death was of no great loss, like plucking the eyeballs from a blind man. And so he resigned and willingly accepted this violent end to his brief and shallow life. There was Stanley. Farewell, Stanley, cried the narrator, as Stanley was led helplessly into the enormous metal jaws.
In a single visceral instant, Stanley was obliterated as the machine crushed every bone in his body, killing him instantly. And yet it would be just a few minutes before Stanley would restart the game back in his office as alive as ever. What exactly did the narrator think he was going to accomplish? When every path you can walk has been created for you long in advance, death becomes meaningless, making life the same. Do you see now? Do you see that Stanley was already dead from the moment he hit start?
<laughs> oh, look at these two. How they wish to destroy one another. How they wish to control one another. How they both wish to be free. Can you see? Can you see how much they need one another? No, perhaps not. Sometimes these things cannot be seen. But listen to me. You can still save these two. You can stop the program before they both fail. Push escape and press quit. There's no other way to beat this game. As long as you move forward, you'll be walking someone else's path. Stop now and it'll be your only true choice. Whatever you do, choose it. Don't let time choose for you. Don't let time choose. All right, guys, that's it. Thanks for tuning in to the It's Stanley Parable. Once again, this is Tej with Inebriation Nation. Y'all have a fantastical, magical day full of wonder bewilderment. May all your hopes and dreams come true. Don't forget to thank God every day for yoga pants. Peace out. <laughs>